Good evening, and welcome to tonight's VCU Health virtual seminar on skin cancer. My name is Blake Belden, and I'm a member of the marketing and communications team at VCU Massey Cancer Center. Tonight, Dr. Lydia Johnson, a dermatologist at VCU Health, will discuss how we can protect our skin from cancer and the latest treatment options available. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to note that we will hold all questions until the end, um, but please feel free to drop any questions you may have in the Facebook comment section throughout the event, and we will address those during the Q&A portion. Dr. Lydia Johnson is a board certified dermatologist, and she joined the faculty of VCU Health Dermatology after 16 years in private practice in the Richmond community. Dr. Johnson has spent her career practicing general dermatology and served as the physician president of Dermatology Associates of Virginia. She is involved in various civic organizations and is a member of the Richmond Medical Society, American Academy of Dermatology, American Medical Association, and National Medical Association, as well as other professional organizations. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson, for joining us today, and I will now turn the show over to you. Thank you very much, Blake. Uh, and thank you all for your time this evening. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Lydia Johnson, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Dermatology at VCU Health System. And I'm going to speak this evening about skin cancer, facts, protection, and prevention. Uh, there are multiple different types of skin cancers. And this evening, I'm going to focus on the three most common types, basal cell cancer, squamous cell cancer, and melanoma and I will also share some tips for prevention and protection. Skin cancer is the most common type of cancer, and there are more than 5 million basal and squamous cell cancers diagnosed annually. We'll start with basal cell carcinoma or basal cell cancer, which is the most common type of skin cancer, accounting for approximately 80% of skin cancers. The lifetime risk of developing a basal cell cancer is at least 20% for the general population. For those with white skin, the risk is greater than 30%. An estimated 2 million Americans are affected by basal cell cancer annually, and that includes individuals who may be diagnosed with more than one basal cell cancer in a given year. Basal cell cancer is more common in males, in those with fair skin, with red or blonde hair, with light eye color, and with skin that is prone to burn rather than to tan. The incidence rates of basal cell cancer double from 40 to 70 years of age. So as people get older, we tend to see more basal cell cancers develop. And a survey of the US Medical Expenditure Panel estimates the annual cost of care for basal cell cancers at about $8 billion. And that's an increase of more than 126% in less than a 10 year period. So basal cell cancer is a big problem and a large burden on the health system. We do know that the primary cause for basal cell cancer is intense intermittent exposure to ultraviolet rays, which then leads to mutation of keratinocytes, which are the skin cells. We also know that certain genetic conditions increase one's risk of developing basal cell cancer, and certain therapies also increase the risk. And those include immunosuppressive medications as may be given to prevent rejection of a solid organ transplant, um, phototherapy for treatment of other conditions, and radiation therapy. Again, the, most, the primary cause for the development of basal cell cancer is sun exposure. So we tend to see these most commonly on the skin of the head and neck and on other chronically exposed skin areas. Basal cell cancers can have multiple different presentations. A very common presentation is a pink papule or bump with a kind of a pearly appearance. And many of these pictures are from the American Academy of Dermatology website. It may also present as a persistently red scaly patch. It may appear as what looks like a scar, a slightly depressed scar on the skin. And here's another example of a basal cell presenting as a slightly depressed scar in pigmented skin. This is from dermatlas.net. 
And another example of a lesion that kind of looks like a scar and has a pearly rolled border. So these are all examples of basal cell cancers. And while they have different presentations, a very common finding is that these are very prone to bleeding easily, either with no trauma at all or with minimal trauma, such as the act of gently washing the face may make it um, bleed. Another common feature is that these do grow. They grow very slowly over time, but they do tend to get larger and don't go away on their own. With regard to treatment of basal cell cancers, excision is a very common uh, treatment method in which the cancer, along with the margin of normal tissue, is cut out using a scalpel blade. It's necessary to cut down to the fat layer of the skin, and then the wound is closed with stitches. And this has a cure rate of about 95 to 99%. Most micrographic surgery is another common treatment for basal cell cancers. This is also known as Mohs surgery. And it is a specialized form of skin cancer surgery that's used to treat skin cancers in areas where there's not a lot of excess skin. It is very commonly used in treating basal cell cancers on the face, on the ears, and in certain other areas, which I will show you. It's also used for treating basal cell cancers that have an aggressive growth pattern. So this here, is, these are diagrams for the, from the American Society of Mohs Surgeons, and they have come up with some appropriate use criteria to determine and identify areas where Mohs surgery is appropriately used. The yellow areas on the face are what we call the mask areas of the face, around the eyes, the nose, around the mouth and the chin, and also the temples and the ears. So these are areas where basal cell cancers are ideally treated with Mohs surgery, um, not only because of the lack of a lot of excess skin for wider margins, but also because we know that the tendency to recur after excision or other procedures is higher in this location and in these locations. Some body sites that we recommend Mohs surgery for also are the nipples, the hands, and the feet as well as the genitalia and the perianal regions. The areas that are demonstrated in green are also appropriate places for using Mohs surgery. So the scalp, the cheeks, the neck, and also the lower legs are appropriate for Mohs surgery. The cure rate with Mohs surgery is about 96 to 99%, so as close to 100% as we can get. Another treatment option for basal cell cancer is called electrodesiccation and curatage. And this procedure is used to treat basal cell cancers on other body areas like the chest, the back, the arms, and the thighs. With this procedure, the cancer is removed with the scalpel and then the base of the lesion is treated with a curette, which scrapes the base of the lesion, and then with cautery, which uses heat to burn the base of the lesion and treat any residual cancer. The cure rates with electrodesiccation and curatage are between 91 and 97 percent, so also highly effective. Other treatment options for basal cell cancer include some topical therapies, particularly for those that are low risk for what we may call superficial basal cell cancers. Imiquimod cream is a topical agent that stimulates the immune system to fight against the cancerous cells. It's usually used for a period of about six weeks, has a lower cure rate than surgery, but can be an option for places where um, the lesion is not amenable to surgery or because surgery is not desired by the patient once they're aware of the potential risks and benefits. 5-fluorouracil cream is a topical chemotherapeutic agent, which can also gradually destroy the cancerous cells and is typically used for a period of about three to four weeks. Its cure rate is also significantly lower than surgery, but it can be effective, particularly where surgery is not an option or is not preferred. Some other treatment options for basal cell cancer include cryosurgery, which is the treatment of the lesion with, with a very cold liquid nitrogen spray. This has variable success rates and is not frequently used to treat basal cell cancers, but it is an option for those who do not want surgery. Photodynamic therapy is a two-step process in which a solution called aminolevulinic acid is applied to the skin. It's a photosensitizing agent, which means 
it makes that area more sensitive to specific lights. And then that area is exposed to blue light for a specified period of time. And that gradually destroys the cancerous cells as well. This would be used for a low risk or superficial basal cell cancer for treatment. And it's important to know that this typically requires multiple treatments. Um, some people know this treatment as the blue light therapy as well, because the light that's used is a blue light. There are different types of radiation therapy that may be appropriate for some basal cell cancers. And there are also some oral medications that are useful in select populations. Bismodigib and sonitigib are oral medications that can be used to treat large basal cell cancers that are too large for surgical procedures, but can lead to a decrease in the size uh, so that the tumor can be amenable to surgery later. It's also used to treat individuals with a specific type of genetic condition called nevoid basal cell cancer syndrome, in which the individual is prone to the development of many, as in hundreds of basal cell cancers, beginning even in childhood. So surgical treatment of these is not very practical. And this oral medication, when taken, uh, can actually lead to either a complete regression and clearance of the skin cancers or can make them smaller. Moving on to squamous cell cancer, which is the second most common type of skin cancer, accounting for approximately 20% of skin cancers. Squamous cell cancer, though less common than basal cell, is more aggressive, which means that it does grow quickly and it can spread to lymph nodes and to other areas of the body or metastasize. Several genetic mutations have been identified within squamous cell cancers. Those who are more prone to developing squamous cell cancer are those with light skin, males, those with increasing age, and those with a history of chronic and long-term ultraviolet exposure. Again, immunosuppressive medications, certain human papillomavirus infections, chronic scarring conditions, arsenic exposure, and certain familial cancer syndromes or genetic conditions can also predispose individuals to squamous cell cancer development. Again, because ultraviolet exposure is the primary cause for squamous cell cancer, these are most commonly found in areas of chronic, skin ex chronic sun exposure. And these two can present in various ways. Before I show images of some squamous cell cancers, I will also add that in individuals with black skin, the face, the lower legs, and even non-sun exposed areas are the most commonly um, located sites. And smoking does increase the risk of squamous cell cancer on the lip. So here's an example of a squamous cell cancer presenting as a persistently scaly red patch. And this is also from the American Academy of Dermatology website. It can appear as a firm bump with a crusted surface. Sometimes the surface actually has a kind of cauliflower appearance. This is an example of an ulcer, which is actually a squamous cell cancer on the lip. Again, smoking does increase the uh, risk of squamous cell cancer here. And you may be able to see that the lower, lap, lower lip looks kind of scaly, and there is significant sun-induced damage on the remainder of the lip as well. I show this picture of an actinic keratosis, which we call a precancer. Um, it is a pre-squamous cell cancer because actinic keratoses can transform into squamous cell cancers over time. Also due to chronic sun exposure, uh, with pre-cancers, they can be treated more readily and more easily than actual squamous cell cancer. So it's important to identify these because we can treat them before they get to the point where they have to be treated surgically as squamous cell cancers. And it's worth noting that not all actinic keratoses transform into squamous cell cancers. There are some that do have features that we know make the risk of that greater, but not all of them do. We don't have great ways of predicting completely which ones will turn into squamous cell cancers. So we do tend to be proactive and try to treat them in the pre-stage. Treatment for squamous cell cancer also includes surgical treatment, excision, with an appropriate margin of about four millimeters, leads to a cure rate of about 95%. 
Mohs surgery, the specialized skin cancer surgery that I previously described, gives us a cure rate of about 97 to 98% for squamous cell cancer. Electrodesiccation and curatage can also be used to treat small and low-risk squamous cell cancers, ones that do not have an aggressive growth pattern. And as mentioned, squamous cell cancer is more aggressive than basal cell and can metastasize to lymph nodes or other distant areas. There is a staging system by the American Joint Committee on Cancer, which stages squamous cell cancers based upon their size, lymph node involvement, and the presence or absence of metastases. And then the National Cancer Comprehensive Network has specific guidelines for how to treat the different stages of squamous cell cancer. Some other treatments, as mentioned with basal cell cancer, which are similar, um, other radiation therapy options. Cryosurgery can be used infrequently for low risk, small lesions um, after consideration of other treatment options and discussion of the risks and benefits. And then there are new medications, immunotherapy medications for advanced squamous cell cancer that has spread. These include simiplimab and pembrolizumab and are typically prescribed by oncologists. Some prevention therapies to consider for those at increased risk of squamous cell cancer, particularly those who've either had multiple squamous cell cancers or may be immunosuppressed for various reasons, um, include a number of things. Um, again, 5-fluorouracil cream can be used for treating precancers and actually for some low-risk squamous cell cancers. Photodynamic therapy can also be used to treat precancers. Some oral options are retinoids, medication called capacetabine and one called sirolimus. And we typically see those used in people who have had organ transplants and are on immunosuppressive medications, which can lead to frequent development of squamous cell cancer. So use, use of these can slow down the development of squamous cells. Uh, a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015 showed that a B3 vitamin called nicotinamide can be protective for the development of both squamous cell and basal cell cancer. The study showed a decrease of about a 20% risk of basal cell and even a 30% decrease in risk of squamous cell cancer for those who had previous non-melanoma skin cancers. And so this is something that I have begun to recommend for my patients who've had non-melanoma skin cancers as a way to protect their skin in addition to other measures that we'll discuss later. I just want to note that the 5-fluorouracil cream, um, it will be oral retinoids and the capacetabine and the sirolimus are off-label uses for squamous cell treatment. So they're not FDA approved, but that there are a number of studies that show protective benefit in these populations. Now I'll move on to melanoma. Um, melanoma is the most aggressive form of skin cancer, and it's a cancerous growth of the melanocytes or the pigment producing cells. Approximately 2% of all new cancers, not including the basal and squamous cell cancers, are melanomas. And a study of tw in 2018 indicated that there are more than 90,000 new cases of melanoma. Numerous genetic mutations have been identified in cutaneous melanoma. And because of that, we do know that there are certain populations that are at increased risk and genetic counseling is recommended for certain populations. The risk factors for melanoma, um, the most common cause for melanoma, again, is chronic sun exposure. So those with a history of sunburns and chronic ultraviolet exposure. Those with a history of indoor tanning, especially before the age of 35. Those with many moles, especially more than 50. Those with a history of dysplastic or atypical moles. Individuals with fair skin, blonde or red hair, blue eyes, and a tendency to freckle when in the sun. Those with a personal or family history of melanoma. And it's also worth noting that a melanoma may arise from a mole, but it also may arise from what was previously normal skin. And once again, there are certain genetic conditions that predispose one to the development of melanoma. So the warning signs and suspicious features of melanoma are frequently referred to as the A, B, C, D, and E's. 
which stand for asymmetry, border irregularity, color that's uneven, diameter that's larger than a pencil eraser, and enlarging or evolving or changing. Another feature that we as dermatologists look for is the ugly duckling sign. So most people have multiple moles and some people have dozens, maybe even more than a hundred moles. And so when we're looking at skin with multiple moles, usually we find that many of them are the same or very similar in appearance. And we look for that one that stands out, what we call the ugly duckling. It may be darker than the others or larger than the others or have a different shape than the others. And we certainly focus on that. And that is one that will be likely to biopsy and be concerned that it may be a melanoma. So some examples from a variety of our dermatology textbooks. Uh, this melanoma here has the features of asymmetry, irregular borders, uneven color, and diameter larger than a pencil eraser. This here on the bottom of the foot from another textbook on the dermatology for skin of color shows asymmetry, irregular borders, uneven color, and also diameter larger than a pencil eraser. This one here is not as striking in that the color is much lighter than in the others. There is a bit of pigment and you may be able to appreciate that it is asymmetric, has irregular color and irregular borders, though it's not larger than the diameter of a pencil eraser. This here on the leg also has asymmetry, irregular borders, uneven color, and is larger than a pencil eraser. So this one here looks very different from the others because it lacks pigment. It, there's no pigment at all in this lesion. It's actually pink or closer to skin color. It is asymmetric. It does have irregular borders and the diameter is larger than a pencil eraser. But this is called an amelanotic melanoma because it lacks pigment. This can be a diagnostic challenge. There are many moles that look very similar, but again, note of the asymmetry and the irregular borders and the size make one suspicious. And there's likely a history that this has changed in size over time. Uh, just like basal cell and squamous cell cancer, we do see melanoma in all different skin types and all different racial groups. Um, in Individuals with brown and black skin, the acral lentiginous melanoma is the most common type. Acral means that it's either on the palms of the hands or the soles of the feet, and lentiginous describes the pattern that we see when we look at it underneath the microscope. And in individuals with black skin, the foot is the most common location for melanoma. And some may find it interesting to know that the legendary reggae musician Bob Marley actually had a malignant melanoma on the sole of his foot. Um, he chose not to have it treated by traditional medical methods and sought alternative medication options. Um, unfortunately, his melanoma progressed and metastasized and was actually the cause of his death. So treatment for melanoma involves wide local excision. And the width of that excision depends on the size of the tumor and the depth of the tumor. And again, there's a staging system for melanoma and there are specific recommendations for treatment of melanoma at various stages. Part of the staging involves determining whether or not there's lymph node involvement. And there's a procedure called a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is done on certain melanoma thicknesses to determine if the local lymph nodes are involved. And again, that determines the staging of the melanoma and therefore treatment. Most micrographic surgery, again, that specialized skin cancer surgery that I described previously, is used for thin melanomas in areas, again, where there's not a lot of excess skin, primarily the face, the scalp, and the ears. This allows for removal of the cancer, but still the ability to evaluate the margins and ensure that they are clear of cancer. For those with advanced stage melanoma or unresectable tumors, there has been a development of a number of systemic medications that have been used to prolong survival for these patients. These medications are usually prescribed by our oncologists and fall into the category of 
immune checkpoint inhibitors, targeted therapies, and mitogen activated kinase inhibitors. And they're usually prescribed in a certain combination to treat those with advanced melanoma. So what was previously um, something that could not be treated and um, could lead to demise within a matter of months, we're now seeing patients with these advanced melanomas who are living for years um, with these advanced tumors. And I am optimistic that one day we will be able to cure advanced melanoma with additional research and discoveries. Some investigational therapies for cutaneous melanoma that are currently ongoing, um, there are some studies looking at viral oncolytic immunotherapy in which components of viruses that are more commonly, that were more commonly exposed to, such as herpes simplex virus, can be injected directly into the tumor and elicit an immune response. So as the immune system is fighting against the virus, it's also fighting against the tumor. Here at VCU, there are clinical trials for a melanoma vaccine for people with advanced melanoma. So once a melanoma has been treated, it's still important to continue management of the patient with regular full skin checks by a dermatologist every three to six months for at least two years and then every six to 12 months thereafter, depending on the stage of the melanoma. We regularly monitor for symptoms that might suggest that the cancer has recurred and spread to other sites or metastasized. And then we order further studies according to the identified symptoms or clinical findings. Some protective behaviors are essential and I will detail those momentarily. And then we also recommend monthly self-examinations. We recommend that people look at their skin once a month to become familiar with what's on the skin with their existing moles and then check once monthly to be able to identify any changes or any new lesions that may arise that need additional investigation. So prevention for all skin cancers, basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma include the following. Seek shade when outside, especially between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. when the ultraviolet rays are most intense. Use sun protection, including lightweight sun protective clothing, a wide brimmed hat, sunglasses, broad spectrum sunscreen of at least SPF 30 or greater. We recommend that the sunscreen be applied at least 30 minutes before going out and is reapplied at least every two hours if out for prolonged periods and also reapplied after getting out of the water. Avoid tanning beds or sun lamps. And again, I've started to recommend oral nicotinamide twice daily for prevention of basal cell and squamous cell cancers in patients who've had previous non-melanoma skin cancers. We recommend monthly self-skin examinations to identify suspicious lesions early. And also we recommend that you seek the assistance of a dermatologist if there are any concerning lesions that arise. So thank you very much for your attention and your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that informative presentation. Um, we will open the floor, and um, before I address any that came through the comment section, I would first like to read a few um, that were submitted in advance. Um, you definitely addressed this in your presentation, but I think it'd probably be good to do a little refresher. Um, how common is skin cancer, and what are the warning signs? So, Skin cancer is very common. Again, you know, it's estimated the lifetime risk of developing a basal cell cancer, which is the most common type of skin cancer, is over 20%. And for individuals with white skin, it's over 30%. So very common. Um, and with the skin being the largest organ of the body, it's not surprising that we do see a lot of skin cancers. Um, the warning signs for skin cancer, as you saw, they can look different ways. Even one skin cancer can have different presentations. So some of the general guidelines that I recommend are, if there's a new lesion that arises on the skin that bleeds easily or spontaneously, it should be checked. If there's a lesion that looks like a wound or an abrasion that doesn't go away after a month or longer, that's also suspicious. If there's something on the skin that starts to change, which could be in size, shape, or color, that should be checked. 
Again, if there's a, a mole that changes, so a pigmented lesion, which could be brown or black or something with color that's changing, it should be checked. Or if there's anything new that arises with any of those A, B, C, D, E features that I mentioned, asymmetry, irregular borders, uneven color, diameter larger than a pencil eraser, those are all things to have checked out. You know, I tell people that if it's nothing great, but if it's something, we can take care of it. And the earlier, the better. Okay, uh, this kind of leads into this next one a little bit. You've touched on that there. How how can you examine yourself for skin cancer? Like how often or any other suggestions you may have? Yeah, I recommend uh, using a full length mirror if possible and standing fully unclothed in front of the mirror. And then for examining the backside of the body, it can be helpful to use a handheld mirror, kind of hold it up and use it to look at your reflection. And doing that again about once a month can be useful um, because one, you'll become familiar with what's on your skin, your moles, what they look like, where they are. And so if something changes or if something new arises, you'll be able to detect it earlier. Okay. What, so what does it mean if your skin cancer has metastasized? Yeah, metastasize means that the cancer has spread beyond the original site. So if it's a skin cancer, now it's spread beyond that, it's in the lymph nodes or it's in a distant site. So if I am, if I was diagnosed with skin cancer, what type of physicians will I see for treatment or, or melanoma? Right. So typically, you know, most commonly the dermatologist is the person who diagnoses the skin cancer. Most skin cancers can be treated um, by the dermatologist alone. If it's advanced, we may need to work with our oncology colleagues to treat with some of those systemic medications that I mentioned, or sometimes we'll send to our surgical oncology colleagues because they'll cut it out and also do that sentinel lymph node biopsy or any, any additional treatment. Some patients need both surgery as well as those oncologic treatments. So it's either a dermatologist or usually a dermatologist working in conjunction with an oncologist or surgical oncologist. It okay. would be one of those three or a combination. Are there well, clinical there trials for skin cancer treatments? Yes, right now here at BCU, there are clinical trials for the melanoma vaccine uh, being done by our oncology colleagues. And there is also a study being done for treatment of advanced squamous cell cancer. There are other academic institutions that are doing other clinical trials as well, but that's what's happening here at BCU currently. Okay. Can skin cancer itch? That's a great question. And it can. Most skin cancers do not, but skin cancers can itch and skin cancers can sometimes hurt. And again, that can be a change. For example, um, one may have a mole that has been present for a long time and it suddenly starts to itch. And that certainly uh, makes it suspicious and would lead me to want to uh, check it out further. How much does sunscreen influence vitamin D exposure? It does influence vitamin D exposure, uh, so much so that, you know, I expect that most people who are using sunscreen regularly, as we're recommending, are deficient in vitamin D um, because of sun protection, also because we don't spend a lot of time outside. Um, however, we still recommend sunscreen as a primary method to protect against skin cancer and recommend that people get vitamin D from dietary sources or through supplements. So we don't recommend not wearing sunscreen in order to get uh, sufficient vitamin D. There are ways to get that sufficient vitamin D and protect the skin from skin cancer. Okay, I'm actually gonna add on to this question a little bit. You said 30 SPF or higher. Um, I've heard before like that you can go too high. Is that a myth? Um, or do, do you get that added protection the more SPF your sunscreen has? So you can't have an SPF that's too high and is detrimental. Um, we know that a minimum of SPF 30 sunscreen when applied appropriately is adequate protection. The benefit beyond 30 is limited and minimal. So we recommend at least 30, but it's not detrimental to go to 50, 70, or even 100. Okay. 
Um, what vitamins and antioxidants can I add to my diet to prevent skin cancer? Great question. Um, there are not any great dietary supplements to prevent skin cancer. Um, there are some topical antioxidants that can be used to help to protect against skin cancer. Um, so some of those are vitamin C, um, hyaluronic acid can also help and protect uh, the skin. So those are some of the common antioxidants that we see that may be helpful. But in terms of something to take from a dietary standpoint, um, nothing that's really been scientifically proven thus far. Okay. Can skin cancer be inherited? So the tendency to develop skin cancer can be inherited. Uh, people who have a first relative who has had melanoma are at increased risk of developing melanoma. Um, people who have relatives with a history of atypical moles and have a lot of moles themselves are at greater risk of developing atypical moles and at increased risk of developing melanoma. All right. Um, I think that's it as far as questions. Well, uh, Dr. Johnson, um, it was such a pleasure having you join us for this discussion. Um, I think this conversation will definitely assist in preventing and treating skin cancers through um, preventative care, early detection, and prompt medical care. Um, for more information about dermatology at VCU Health, visit vcuhealth.org and follow at VCU Health on Facebook. Um, for more information about skin cancer, you can visit Massey Cancer Center at MasseyCancerCenter.org. Um, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Johnson, and to all of you who joined us today, have a great night. Thank you very much.